Hulk Hogan could not survive the gravest challenge. Hulkamania is dead. It's dead, Monsoon. Long live The Undertaker. For six days until Tuesday in Texas when they mucked the whole fucking thing up. I'm John Renton with the Retro View WWE Survivor Series 1991. Coming up on the 30 year anniversary of a show where I was 10 years old, almost 11 when it first happened. My fucking goodness, where is the time gone? Like, Sam through the hour ass, these are the days of our thighs. Chicken thighs, turkey thighs, ham thighs. Well, if you wanted to cook the whole goddamn pig, I suppose you could do that, but enough about eating all the tasty dishes around the holidays with our friends, our family members, our loved ones, our pets. Maybe our pets will cook for us because soon animals will roam the goddamn earth. As our overlords, I, for one, welcome our new feline, you know, canine and animal overlords because soon they will take over. It'll be like After Earth, hopefully with better acting. Anyway, enough of this very, very odd intro. Yes, this is about Survivor Series 1991, and Tuesday in Texas, in case you wonder why I'm talking about that, if you're unfamiliar with that event, and quite frankly, if you're not a longtime fan, you really should be, this event was basically just a hype package. It was the second annual pay-per-view that Vince McMahon came up with, Survivor Series that is, and he decided to start experimenting with a weekly pay-per-view concept. Fucking bold, especially fucking bold considering at the time, pay-per-view was still... A bit of a new concept. They had the closed circuit thing for WrestleMania, and then obviously with Mania 4 where everybody got on the floor and did the dinosaur rather than pay attention to that long, arduous, you know, bold uh, move to have a goddamn tournament all over WrestleMania in front of a crowd that really didn't fucking care about it. I might retroview that at some point. The whole point is, is he decided, I'm going to do weekly pay-per-views. I'm going to I'm gonna get all the money out of the people, pal. It's such good shit. Ha ha ha. I'm a genius. Unfortunately, Tuesday in Texas did not work, and if you study up on it at all, you will see why. The card wasn't all that great, but yes, this was used as a vehicle to hype up Tuesday in Texas. It was a mere six days away, because this took place the day before Thanksgiving. And it, in 1991, that is, not the day before this Thanksgiving, because that would have been really goddamn hard to do, considering, if you look at this card, some of the wrestlers have passed away. Some of the wrestlers uh, didn't even make it another, you know, 12 years after this. It's really goddamn sad. Really, really fucking sad. This event also was really fucking sad because after a pretty hot start as far as, like, crowd reactions and everything, they really just got drained and drained to the point where they didn't give a shit about the match that followed Hogan and Undertaker. And to the point where I think that there were even fans leaving the goddamn arena because there were empty seats and some crowd shots even in the main event, which is a really good sign. WWE was starting to falter at this point, even though they were still the industry industry standard. Easy for fucking me to say. Jim Hurd had basically destroyed in Napalm WCW to the point where they were going to have to be uh, reinvigorated and reinvented and basically just re you know reignited. They were basically were just going to have. To have a fire, you can't start a fire without a spark that's guns for hire, and they brought in Bill Watts. And then Bill Watts, even though he had some good ideas, it ended up kind of destroying everything. But enough about WCW, because that was in 1992. There at the Joe Louis Arena, 17,500 people, of course, naturally they inflated the numbers up to 20,000 plus people. Will you be serious? Monsoon and Heenan on commentary, by the way, which was really goddamn cool. Chris Chavis taking on Kato. If Chris Chavis does not sound like a familiar name, you might know him as Tatanka. Yes, that same Tatanka. Kind of funny that he worked a dark match here, but he would then give, be given the Tatanka gimmick and would actually go on an undefeated streak that lasted longer than Goldberg's undefeated streak. Really goddamn weird, that. So, yes, it was the gravest challenge for Hulk Hogan, and Bobby Heenan's just like, Hulkamania is going to die tonight. It's going to die, Monsoon. I miss Heenan and Monsoon as a commentary duo. I really do. I mean, naturally, even if both had lived and not had the health issues they had that led to their deaths, I, they obviously would not be doing commentary at this point. It's just so sad to think that Monsoon wouldn't even make it out of the decade. He would die, I believe, in late 99. His son would pass away. His last appearance would be at Mania 15 earlier that year. He would be one of the judges uh, for the Brawl for All. Or you'd just be featured in the crowd. I forget exactly what. I put a lot of Mania 15 out of my mind, but I remember Monsoon being there, and he just looked so disheveled and beat, and really losing your child would do that, and also the health issues. So, the same venue, by the way, for Halloween Havoc 1994 and 1995. Yes, where um, Hogan decided to uh, destroy everybody, and then somebody butchered the friendship, and then the following year they had the Yeti! Is that a head he's got on, or a stump? So if it seems like I'm stalling talking about this event, it's because it wasn't very good. Why not give it a little bit of history and why not have a little bit of fun? 
So, Eclipse of Superstars, uh, the taping where you had uh, the Cobra Bite, the Snack bit. Oh no, the Snack, sneaky Snack, sneaky, devenomized Snack. It decided to, you know, latch on to Savage's arm. As a 10 year old, this fucking frightened me. So, a little bit of backstory. Jake the Snake Roberts had started to turn more heel and everything. Was actually going to feud with Ultimate Warrior. But then Ultimate Warrior decided to hold Vince up for money and then, you know, go off and everything because he felt he was worth more than he actually, you know, got. Even though he never fucking deserved a penny from wrestling because he was never any fucking good. And by the way, fuck Ultimate Warrior. I'm glad he's dead. Queering doesn't make the world work. And all the other shit that he said. But, that being said, we get close to the Superstars taping where Savage had been he'd been trying to get reinstated after losing a uh, retirement match against the Ultimate Warrior. And um, Jake Roberts tried him in the ropes and got a devenomized co King Cobra onto his arm. And it's just doing that and everything. I don't know. Somebody's going to try to gift that. Please don't. Um, like, I have an audience that will gift things. But... It's just funny, he's just latching onto him, latching onto him, biting him, everything. Oh, that snake better be devenomized. It better be. Vince is selling the hell out of this. Piper's on commentary. <laughs> and Liz eventually comes down. It was a big deal. As a 10 year old, this fucking traumatized me. And I mean, I'm not scared of snakes. I mean, I wouldn't want to see a fucking King Cobra right in front of me. And if I saw a King Cobra right in front of me now, I'd be like, what the fuck? We're in Washington. Why are you here? Who let you out of your cage? Also, how and why am I talking to a snake? Why, why, why? Why am I talking to a computer? So, we then do a pre-tape with uh, President Jack Tunney, who was a tremendous president, and then he had to talk. I mean, he didn't appear all that often, so it meant something, uh, but he says, I accept full responsibility for allowing such a potentially dangerous reptile at ringside. That's an actual phrase that was said on wrestling television in 1991. Uh, Denenomized is actually what he said. He said the word denenomized. I don't know why that made me laugh so much. Probably because Tony knew words. The best words. He just didn't understand how to use them. And he says, effective immediately, the King Cobra and all reptiles are banned from ringside. Another phrase said on wrestling television in 1991. This, by the way, took up about the first six minutes of the goddamn show. Because then commentary was talking about <clears throat> all this stuff. Savage is reinstated. And he's going to have a match of Tuesday in Texas. And that ain't going to be the last time or even the first time you're going to hear about Tuesday in fucking Texas. <sighs> so, Monsoon and he and talk about Hogan versus Undertaker. We get the first uh, four on four Survivor Series elimination match. So, we don't get. The funniest thing about this is it broke from tradition because they used to have, like, you know, five on five, or even in the case of, I believe, I believe 87 and 88. I think, eight, well, 88 for sure, but I believe 87 also had. They had a 10 on 10 tag. Yes, they had 10 tag teams <laughs> on either side. The ring had to have been reinforced. And they also have five-on-five -five elimination matches. This was the first event that actually had a singles match, not just for a championship, a singles match in general that wasn't a dark match. Big goddamn deal. Breaking from tradition. And then pretty soon, they would get to where they would barely have any Survivor Series elimination matches on the goddamn card. Like 1998. I think 1998 was just a Deadly Games tournament and like maybe one elimination match. Whole point is, hey, at least it wasn't 99. Boy, that was a mess. This had some good stuff to it. It had some good components. None of the matches really fired, that's the thing. Like, they just, it was all about Tuesday in Texas, Tuesday in Texas. They were basically prostituting this show that had had a pretty good fan base. You know, it had been around since 1987, so 87, 88, 89, 90. Some pretty hot crowds and everything, and they decided at the Joe Louis Arena, which has, you know, Detroit, Michigan, they'd seen a whole lot of really good cards. You know, you had the Sheik, um, uh, he ran, well, he ran the Kobo, but the whole point is, is, Detroit was a hotbed for wrestling for a number of years. And by this point, they were basically relying on the brand name. And the ta the teams, the tag teams, the teams were Ric Flair, who had just come in recently, and at one point had had the real world heavyweight championship, uh, you know, the big gold belt, because Jim Hurd didn't want to give him his $25,000 deposit back. So he took the title there and was showing it, and then there was a dispute, and he got the money back. And to continue the storyline, he was carrying, and it was clearly obvious, it was an old WWF Tag Team Championship. It was clearly obvious, because even when they digitized it out, anybody with the benefit of eyesight would have been able to tell that. <laughs> so, Ric Flair, the Mountie, I'm the Mountie! God, he was really great on some Dark Side of the Ring episodes. 
uh, Ted DiBiase, the Warlord, with Mr. Perfect in a Skittles tracksuit, as I uh, noted, because, my God, that thing was so loud, so fucking loud, that anybody would have been able to see it. Even Stevie Wonder. But Stevie Wonder's a terrible father. He never even sees his kids. Moving on. Sensational Sherry and all the goddamn garish makeup. Jimmy Hart and Harvey Whippleman, who, every time I see him, I feel like I need to fucking pressure wash myself and everybody around me, because he just looks really scuzzy and disgusting. Taking on Rowdy Roddy Piper, uh, Bret Hart, almost said Jimmy Hart, Jimmy Hart pulling double duty. No, Bret Hart, Virgil, and the British Bulldog. I noted while watching this, and yes, it is a 30-year-old event, and some of these talents were in their 30s at this point, but some of them, and some of them didn't even fucking make it to 40. I mean, and some just didn't make it in general. Monsoon and Heen are no longer with us. Um, the you know all the all the heel side is as far as wrestlers. Mr. Perfect isn't though. Because he had the back injury. Perfect isn't. Sherry isn't. Roddy Piper isn't. And uh, British Bulldog isn't. British Bulldog wouldn't even make it to age 40. <clears throat> um, the crowd cheered Piper wildly. And at one point he kissed Sensational Sherry. And then uh, Heenan said to Monsoon, Well, if Piper kissed you, you'd want to get a shot. Well, then again, maybe not. Because <clears throat> um, he made a reference of getting a tetanus shot. So it started with DBS being targeted. And then Flair and Piper and the crowd popped for them. 11 minutes in. Flair does a, uh, you know, uh, move off the top and pins British Bulldog, even though he wasn't a legal man. That's the thing. The referee kind of just threw the shit out of the window. It was like just out of the window, not out the window, just out of the window, because you have to emphasize that right there. Proper grammar is key. I always use proper grammar. I use words, not even the best words. I just use words, and it comes out like a word salad. So anyway, it's four to three, and then Piper um, gets beat up for a bit, and then Virgil, because Virgil needed to be featured at this point. Wait, no, he didn't. <clears throat> he did get a big pop earlier in the year when he waffled uh, Ted DiBiase. Not Blue waffled him, because that would have been a different kind of syrupy goodness. I'm just going to let that marinate in your heads, and provide that anybody is still watching, after I reference the bluish, waffleish, uh, you know, goodness that it was, let's talk about Piper pinning the Warlord. We're 18 minutes in, by the way. And this match went 22-45 or something like that. So to break down a few minutes later, a DQ gets called after Ric Flair got tossed over the top. Everybody's just brawling in the ring. And the actual quote was, the referee has disqualified everyone who is battling in the ring. Okay, I mean, some. there were times I was done in the territories and it sort of made sense to come back for a hot angle. And that made, and, you know, other stuff, Jim Crocker Promotions and other companies did. Similar things. Maybe not that quite same thing, but they did something as a way to advance it. This just seemed lazy. So Ric Flair was the sole survivor. And then we got a little bit of a brief beat down, and then we got interviews. A lot of interviews. That's the thing. I think the show was like 50% fucking hype for Tuesday in Texas and interviews. So me and Jeans were uh, you know, on the big stage, big podium that they had with Randy Savage, who comes out to a pop that recently reinstated Randy Savage, and he talks about the Cobra stuff. And all, co all King Cobras are banned from ringside. King Cobra, retreat! Ow. Shouldn't try to do a King Cobra voice, I suppose, since that was a terrible impression. And a hype of Tuesday in Texas. Oh, there's that pay-per-view again. Da, da, da. Here's Liz. And Heenan was uh, quoted as saying, most married women don't look that good. Liz, ever the epitome of loveliness and hotness and my fucking goodness in WCW. God damn, she looked good. And fuck Lex Luger for uh, contributing to her death. So... Sadly, all three of these people are gone. Um, Liz made it to 2003. Savage made it to 2011. Still wish he would have been in the Hall of Fame before that. Whatever you believe. You wanted the family in or Vince held a vendetta. I actually choose to believe both. And Mean Gene left us a couple years ago. Now, we get to the Berserker. Uh, with uh, Skinner and Colonel Mustafa, a.k.a. the Iron Sheik. And if you thought the Iron Sheik in 1989 WCW was bad, oh boy, you have not seen 1991 Iron Sheik. Mm. And uh, Mighty Clean and Hercules. Hercules, who's also no longer with us. With General Adnan, it's funny re-watching some of the later uh, AWA events, like Battle at the Bay and other ones and stuff like that, and Wrestling for a Cure and various other ones, just various events, and noticing how many people... From the later era of the AWA that Vince poached to bring out to his, you know, his company. It's just hilarious. And Mr. Fuji. Mr. Fuji, Hercules, uh, they are no longer with us. And uh, on the face side, uh, Sergeant Slaughter, 
Jim Duggan, El Matador, Tito Santana, and Texas Tornado, who, man, this was his second to last pay-per-view shot on, you know, for the company. I'm just going to let that sit right there. Kerry Von Erich, he was technically never eliminated from the 91-92 Royal Rumbles because both feet must touch the floor. Now I'm just going to get away from that because I'm just going to let that marinate for a second, but it's kind of funny how Sergeant Slaughter was a heel at SummerSlam 91, which was just three months prior. And then, because at this time they only held four pay-per-views a year, or in this case, five pay-per-views a year, <laughs> then they would go back to four for 1992, which is smart because Tuesday in Texas, again, didn't do very well. Slaughter it, Slaughter would, you know, do some vignettes and do some stuff like that. He would want his country back, and then he would turn face and join Jim Duggan. And he wasn't even heel. As good as his heel run was, and it really was very good. I mean, I hated him as a kid, and I remember him very briefly from... Seeing, you know, I, I caught some N or AWA syndicated programming uh, at the time because it would, you know, air in local broadcasts. I would catch some of that and I'd be like, what is Slaughter doing? It's like, why is Slaughter here? He look, he looks like a bigger star. Even as a kid, I realized he should have been there. Then he came back in um, mid-99, no, later 99, or late, later 99. Boy, I'm jumping way ahead. Later 1990. And... He would win the title from the Ultimate Warrior at uh, Royal Rumble 91. Oh no, Warrior lost and got so upset for a title he never fucking deserved. So, Slaughter would then battle Hogan at WrestleMania 7, would lose it, would battle with him through to SummerSlam 91, and then turn face by this point. So he wasn't even heel for a goddamn year, or it was, it was around a year. But the whole point is, is, as good as that was, he would turn back to being a babyface. <laughs> and I don't know why it made me... I don't know why it made me laugh. It, it's just, it seems so odd because we're so used to now so much weekly programming and monthly pay-per-views that you look back at something like this and realize there was syndicated programming, superstars, wrestling challenge. You had to watch some of the stuff. You had to catch it pre-taped or not. You had to catch this stuff. It was a lot harder to catch up on some of this, even though Vince would have the announcers hammered into your head in a better way because Monsoon and Heenan were really, really good at their job. Jesse Ventura had left by this point. Slaughter's a face, and this wasn't very good. This, 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 it was better than the other elimination matches. Uh, but Mustafa got eliminated eight minutes, and that was probably about eight minutes too long for him to be in the match. And then the other three fall within four minutes later, within a two minute time period. And the face is sweet. That's really all I got to say about that. Mean Gene interviews Jake the Snake Roberts in such a sparkly shirt, my fucking goodness. The shirt. Jake. I mean, he's clean now, but. Who, who, was it Jake that was on so many drugs? Or was it somebody in wardrobe that was on so many goddamn drugs? My fucking goodness, that was ridiculous. So we get clips of Flair and Hogan facing up on the funeral parlor. The butterflies in your stomach, big man! You know, Flair coming in. and It was a big deal. It was a big fucking deal for Ric Flair, who I did, you know, at the time, loved when he was in WCW. I mean, even though he's a heel, you hated him, but you loved him. And then he came over, you're wondering, what the fuck is going on? Like, he was just on television, like, I think at the Clash of Champions in June of that year. And then suddenly he's not there at Great American Bash 91 because of the dispute with Jim Hurd. Because Jim Hurd was a goddamn idiot. And the fact that Jim Hurd, that goddamn moron, is still fucking alive somehow despite all the shit he did to wrestling, I don't fucking get it. So, Vince Russo did worse. Now, they're doing... So, not even a few months later, he's here. And he's on television. And it's a big fucking deal. And then he uh, he talks about, you know, the whole facing Hogan and everything, which, honest to God, should have happened to Mania 8. I mean, I love Savage and Flair, but you just think that they would have had happen. But now Vince got cold feet, or he couldn't get one of them to do the job. Whatever you want to believe. That being said, Savage and Flair was a better match. Because we got Hogan versus Sid Justice. Hooray. Sid's uh, two Mania appearances. Both the main events. I mean, he lost both of them. He lost both of them. It's a good record. Anyway, so uh, what led to Taker versus Hogan? And Taker coming out of a box, and anybody that comes out of a box immediately gets over. Sometimes. It worked for Cactus Jack around this time when he came back in 1991. Appearing out of a box! What's in the box? So, Taker uh, was choking Hogan. Savage and Piper held him off with chairs. And he ripped off the chain and everything. That was some good stuff. 
Taker's entrance, the kids are all scared, and that was good. That was good. Seriously, I don't think you understand how much I loathe the existence of children. Not to say that children don't deserve to be raised well, but if anybody ever asked me if I could watch their kid, that would be a bad idea, because I would sit them in front of the TV, say, what kind of snacks you want? Da, da, da. Let's sit here. You know where the bathroom is? Okay, watch this movie. That's how I would babysit. Why? Because kids annoy me. I used to work in, at a movie theater, and I pretty much learned to despise children and bad parents. Raise your kids better, you stupid shits. Anyway, enough of a PSA and getting on my soapbox here. Hogan comes out to a pop. Taker with Paul Bearer versus Hulk Hogan for the WWE Championship. And oh god, it hurts. Please, make it stop. Make it stop. Make it stop. Make it stop. Hogan, can you hear that? It's the sounds of silence. And especially, it is going to be the sound of booze. Because there were some booze during this match. Mainly because... Taker was choking Hogan for about 20 minutes of this 12-minute match. Don't ask me how that works. And Hogan did the big man, st or the stuff with the big man, and was trying to take him off his feet, and Taker zooming. This was when Taker was supposed to be the undead zombie, not really doing anything and not becoming the performer that he would become years and years later. And stick around. Stick around. Stick around. And torpedo his fucking in-ring legacy, because he just didn't know when to fucking quit. So, um, later... Tombstone to Hogan. Oh my God! And no cells, just no cells. The crowd started. I mean, there were cheers, but there were some boos. They tried to hide it, but they couldn't. There were some boos. People were getting sick of Hogan by this point, they, because he'd been around in WWE alone for nearly eight years by this point, and he was over in the AWA and the Mystic Man stole him basically because well Hogan actually decided, hey Vern, I don't like that you're trying to keep my money. I'm gonna go here. <laughs> you go that way. I'll go home. So. Uh, Flair comes down, he gets knocked down, then puts a uh, chair in after Paul Bearer interferes, and Taker hits a tombstone on the chair, and this is a terrible camera shot. There was about 80 miles of daylight between uh, Hogan's head and the chair. Not as bad as when they shot Linda McMahon getting, uh, you know, <coughs> um, dropped on the stage by Kane. That was even more egregious because you would have thought they would have learned some 12 years later. This was... This is ridiculous. And Tombstone, one, two, three. Undertaker is the WWE champion. Hulkamania is dead, Monsoon. It's dead. Long live the Undertaker. Till Tuesday in Texas when they did a dodgy finish and stuff like that. And yes, I will retroview Tuesday in Texas because I hate myself. I wonder if they include any of the dark matches. That'd be kind of cool. Anyway, yeah. That was it. And they showed the kids crying. Love it. Hino was mocking the kids crying. Stupid little shit. That's what you get for having heroes. That's what you get. And I was 10 years old at this time. You would have thought I would have been the target audience. No. Hogan got me into WWE wrestling, admittedly. He really did. In fact, he got me into wrestling in general because I was four years old when I saw War to Sell the Score. And even though I'm watching, da, 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 you see Hogan. He's a cartoon character. You see Piper. He just has that slappable face. And you see all the stuff going on. It makes sense. And it makes sense why a four-year-old kid would be immediately just drawn to Hogan because he was larger than life. But by this point, people were getting sick of him. And then yeah, they do all this, oh, uh, Undertaker's a WWE champion. Then they kill it with interviews, a lot of interviews. I think they killed the show's momentum. I think they killed the audience's interest, judging by the Tuesday in Texas buy rate. Uh, mean Gene interviews Piper. And Piper chimes in, yeah, just doing all that and everything. I miss Roddy Piper. Um, and Sean Mooney, who? I just, I, I love that from Hina. I love Sean Mooney. I thought Sean, it was nice to see Sean Mooney on NWA programming briefly. And I know he's got, or he had his own show for a while, but I like, I like Sean Mooney. He interviews Flair and Mr. Perfect in the Skittles tracksuit. And Amin Jean is interviewing IRS and the Natural Disasters, while Sean Mooney interviews LOD and the Big Boss Man for the main event. Oh, look, more interviews. Yay. Just what I wanted. And I love Mean Gene. I like Sean Mooney. I'm just saying at this point, it's like, God damn it. It's interviewing Jack Tunney. It's a rematch of Tuesday in Texas. So then we get to the Nasty Boys and the Beverly Brothers with the Genius. You know, the Genius is one of the biggest biggest examples of nepotism in wrestling. Because it's not that he was bad in the ring. In fact, if anything, he was actually quite good. He just had no personality. He wasn't interesting. He was a creep. And if you read up on him, you know what I'm fucking talking about. Also, his New Japan commentary is kind of shit. And Jimmy Hart. Jimmy Hart. Love Jimmy Hart. On my Mount Rushmore, favorite managers of all time. I'd say Jimmy Hart, Jim Jim Cornette. Bobby Heenan. In fact, I would just have to say Bobby Heenan is the head of it, and then you could have four below. So Bobby Heenan, Jimmy Hart, Jim Cornette, 
J.J. Dillon? J.J. Dillon, maybe? God, that's a good question. Really good question on who else that would be. I guess, I guess J.J. Dillon. But God, you know, there's just so many. There's just so many that you could think. Sherry was really good. I don't know if she'd be on the Mount Rushmore, but she was really goddamn good. But anyway, let's just talk about this match. By the way, the Bushwhackers and the Rockers were um, their opponents, and my fucking goodness, this match went on forever. Basically, it was all to tease more dissension between the Rockers, because at one point, after the Bushwhackers had been eliminated, and one of the Beverly Brothers had been eliminated, Mario Gennetti accidentally picked up one of the opponents, clocked Shawn Michaels in the face, and got pinned one, two, three. Was he the legal man? Who the fuck knows? Uh, this went way too long. Marty tried to make this work, tried to take him on three on one, but much like Sonny, fell by the wayside. One, two, three, and there you go. So all the heels, besides Bo Beverly, I believe, survived. And then commentary talks about Tuesday in Texas. My God, Tuesday in Texas, Tuesday in Texas. It's going to be ringing in my head and some 30 years later. IRS and the natural disasters, typhoon and earthquake. John Tenta, rest in peace, John Tenta, no longer with us. Uh, taking on the big boss man and LOD, Hawk and Animal. All three no longer with us. This is a really sad aspect of the show. Crab pop for the faces, uh, big lads smacking into each other, and also IRS, which sounds like a disservice, because IRS is actually a pretty big guy. Mike Rotunda, take a look at some of the shit that he did when he was part of, he was part of the U.S. Express and WWE. He had traveled various territories. It was great in Jim Crocker Promotions, and then they made him a fucking boat captain for some reason. I don't get it. But he was part of, you know, he's part of the Varsity Club. And him and Rick Steiner had a great moment at Starcade 88 where Rick Steiner won the TV championship and celebrated like he won the goddamn, you know, Super Bowl and everything. It was so fucking great. But Mike Rotunda was a great worker. The IRS gimmick, silly. Of course, Vince going after the tax people. But Mike Rotunda made it work the best he could. And then we get the briefcase involved, and Big Boss Man gets laid out. One, two, three. Three on two. And then a miscue. Oh, no. Later, Typhoon gets hit with the briefcase. He gets eliminated. Earthquake says, hey, IRS, fuck you. I don't pay my taxes, and I'm gone. We're leaving. He goes two on one with uh, LOD, then says, hmm, these lads are going to beat me. I'm going to go. And then Boss Man says, no, 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 not today. You go back there, and he gets laid out with a flying clothesline from Hawk. One, two, three, and that's it. There you go. And then Sean Mooney says that he talked to Hogan. Hogan will let his, will do his talking in the ring, and then Mean Gene is involved in a pre-tape uh, down in the uh, catacombs of Joe Louis Arena, where Paul Bearer and Undertaker have a casket, and he says, look in there. And Mean Gene is horrified. There's a cameraman, seemingly dead, but the camera's still on. I would be horrified by that, too. That poor tech guy. My God, that cameraman in the casket had a family. Seemingly. Possibly. Maybe the camera had a family. And says, Tuesday in Texas. <clears throat> so, yeah, I'm going to retro review Tuesday in Texas either later this month or at some point. Anyway, let me know your thoughts in the comments. Like, share, subscribe, Twitter handle in the description. I'm John Ritland. I'll see you soon.